Greetings, Trinity St. Peter's and all of those who are joining us online. I feel like each week I'm getting more and more used to saying that. Um, it is hard to believe um, that it has been this many weeks that we have been worshiping together in this way. Um, and I just want to take a moment to say thank you. Thank you to all of those who have helped make these videos possible. Uh, to all of you who have been so patient uh, with us as we've figured out this new reality in which we live. Uh, so as we sit in this month of stewardship, uh, know that I am keenly aware of how grateful I am for you all. And as we are still in stewardship month, we have the privilege today of hearing from another one of your fellow parishioners about why they are a part of Trinity St. Peter's and why they find it important to give. So on that note, we'll let them speak. Why do I love being a member of the Trinity St. Peter's community? Many reasons. Uh, the first is that I was drawn to the architecture. I'm a history buff and I love all things Renaissance, all things medieval. And the TSP, Trinity St. Peter's main building, the sanctuary, is a little foreboding, honestly, but beautiful, kind of a medieval fortress. Um, the interior e is even more amazing. Soaring ceilings, glowing stained glass windows. I stayed because of the people I encountered inside. I was made to feel welcome, not an outsider. During the after-service coffee hour, people came up to me sharing their stories. They were also interested in my story, my well-being. I stayed because of the worship service. Sermons are always intelligent, always relevant to me, my life, what's happening in the world, and they move me. The music, the music is simply transcendent. Songs from the Episcopal hymnal, of course, but also music from the um, from the 19th, 20th, and even 20th, 21st century, as well as ancient melodies. Our organist, our choir are so good, I challenge anyone in San Francisco to find better. Going back to the people, the members of Trinity St. Peter's community are warm, fun, even, I must admit, a little wacky before the COVID-19 lockdown, and hopefully again once more, once it's lifted, people here socialize a lot gather in their homes for what are called uh, Trinity St. Peter um, Circle Suppers. Uh, they go to plays together, operas, they gather in Golden Gate Park, and that's wonderful. It's wonderful to have a community of fellow worshipers, but also a community of, of friends. Um, and finally, the most important thing to me about Trinity St. Peter's is that the Episcopal Church in general, and our church in particular, um, are rooted in their commitment to Jesus Christ and the understanding that his life, his lessons, his legacy bring, an understanding that every human being is a manifestation of Christ. And that understanding makes Trinity St. Peter's a very welcoming place. That means that people on very di different faith journeys are, are welcome, very different perspectives on faith. Some people that don't have um, faith at all um, are members of our community. And I, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that diversity. Um, I hope you join us soon for a worship service and become part of our community too. Our reading today is from the book of Exodus. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they, what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, 
in the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When I was in college, I majored in history and art history. And so one of the classes that we all had to take was called historiography. And it was a bit of a gauntlet, I have to say. Um, it was well known for being difficult and challenging. Uh, but one of the first things that I remember about sitting in that course was just the very notion of historiography. 
That is that history is a story that we construct. And so part of the goal of the course was to give us the tools to be able to look critically and reflectively at the very subject that we were studying and see that it was changeable, it was um, malleable, and that oftentimes we needed to be critical of it in order to do our work best. That history matters, that where we come from matters, and it matters how we tell that story. And we see this a bit in our reading from Exodus today. The Israelites are somewhere between oppression and freedom, having been led through the Red Sea, um, having seen the great defeat of the Egyptian army. There was so much going on. There was all, all of these exciting things. And in this part of Exodus, we find the people in a decidedly unexcited place. Uh, they are somewhere between the old and the new, and they murmur against God or complain, depending on the translation. Uh, they complain to Moses that God might as if God was going to kill them out here in the wilderness, God might as well have done it back in Egypt and saved them all the effort. And in that moment, their very recent uh, history is somewhat rewritten. <laughs> In the face of scarcity, certain parts of their story fall away and suddenly their main memory of the land of Egypt is not the slavery, the oppression, all of the challenges, but rather the full pots of meat that they were able to eat. That they had everything that they physically needed became their story. And I really feel for the Israelites. I mean, our collect today, uh, the prayer that we read at the beginning of our worship service is grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that endure. And, you know, that's all well and good to not worry about earthly things until those earthly things are really high stakes things. <laughs> I mean, the Israelites are in the wilderness. They're in a completely new place that feels inhospitable, that feels strange. And it's been a month. Freedom isn't looking like what they thought it would. And, you know, it'd be interesting, I think, if we could go back and sort of like poll people to see like before they were uh, put into the wilderness, you know, what, what do you expect freedom to be like? And then maybe at this point ask them again, well, was it what you expected? Um, because my guess was, is that there wasn't a lot of detail <laughs> in the dream of what freedom really would be. It was always just sort of a thing that you wanted, but it was far off, it was hard to understand. Uh, we want that, we want that thing. But the reality of what this new world, what this new life meant, proved much more challenging than they thought. And I see so much of this, um, this need for revisiting how we tell our story and the propensity of us in the face of scarcity to look back with a certain wistfulness and nostalgia at a past that if we really looked at it, I, I don't think we'd really want to repeat. I mean, one of the most obvious would be the history of the Confederacy, the history of Civil War, and the way that some revisionists have done a lot of work to try to say that it wasn't about slavery, when in fact the people who were doing it told us over and over again in their speeches, in their sermons even, uh, that it was, in fact, very much about slavery and racism. But it's not just limited to our country. I mean, we do this in our own lives. How many times have we said, well, you know, that relationship wasn't that bad, or, you know, that job was pretty terrible, but, I mean, the pay was really good. Um, and we, you know, we do it in the Episcopal Church as well. 
Uh, there was a recent blog, which I would encourage uh, you all to read in its entirety. It's, it's rather long, but very, very good. Um, from the crusty old dean, and he writes a blog. His real name is the Reverend Tom Ferguson. Um, but he writes a blog uh, pretty regularly looking at the Episcopal Church. He's served on presiding bishop staffs. He's worked in seminaries. He's currently a parish priest. He's served on some of our ecumenical councils and just has a very, um, as a deep and wide view of the Episcopal Church. And so in his most recent blog, he talks about the, a few myths that we in the Episcopal Church tend to hold to. As he writes, uh, we usually skip from slavery to the civil rights movement of the 1960s and skip over everything in between. We talk about Absalom Jones and Jonathan Merrick Daniels because we don't want to talk about how the church's complicity with racism and slavery and we just want to pat ourselves on the back and only tell what we think are the good parts. This at times willful refusal to look at our own history of race and racism has shaped some of the received historical narrative of the Episcopal Church. For one, the uh, received historical narrative that the Episcopal Church is the only or one of the few denominations that didn't split over slavery. He writes, uh, my response to that is usually something like blithely asserting the Episcopal Church did not split over slavery when in fact it did, has become our own version of the lost cause, a whitewashing and rewriting of the past by those in power to avoid confronting systemic racism. He goes on to point out that even if this were true, that the Episcopal Church didn't split over slavery, that this is no fact to be proud of, that we should feel some degree of shame, that what that means is that we as a denomination, we as a church, did not stand against racism, that we instead made compromises with those who owned slaves. He goes on, um, Tom Ferguson goes on to remind us that W.E.B. Du Bois wrote that, and this is a paraphrase of the quote, of all denominations, the Episcopal Church has done the least for black people. How we tell our story matters. And it's tempting to look back at a history of oppression, a history in which we as a church have sometimes failed to stand up for what is right and good and holy and focus more on, you know, how many good people there were, how, you know, we can't really judge them because it was a different time, which even though as um, Tom Ferguson goes to point out, there were plenty of people in their own time who did judge them. Um, but what, what is it about this human propensity to look back so wistfully? And, you know, just to take it, uh, at a more minute level in the church, a more current level, I, I feel like I hear this all the time when we say, you know, we, we used to have so many people here, right? I mean, how many of us, I know I've said that before myself, we used to have so many people here. But, uh, and you know, and this is a hard truth, I think for us as a church, I have also heard of stories from those time periods of the high rates of alcoholism and abusive behaviors of many of the clergy and bishops, a certain um, father knows best attitude that stifled dissent or challenge within churches, and the segregation of anyone not white into so-called ethnic churches that were and are uh, under-resourced and marginalized. We also have to tell the story of the overt and subtle ways in which women were kept out of ordained ministry. And even when they were allowed into it, struggled to find employment and were often treated very poorly. Then there's the violence and the venom of the church towards the LGBTQ community that so many of us know so well. The number of unpaid and often female volunteers 
who did a huge amount of work to keep our churches running. Many of our structures, in fact, from the church office to the way that we organize our ministries stem from this assumption that at a time we had a massive unpaid workforce of women doing the work of church. And then, of course, there were the number of people in those pews, right? That at a time it was a societal box to check and while we can't say for sure what everyone's faith was like, I suspect that a good bit of it was more of a performative faith and maybe not much else. And I'm not just talking about the 1950s, to be clear. I mean, I'm talking about like the 1990s to the present day. And because to my knowledge, to this day, there is not one cardinal parish in the Diocese of California that is considered multi-ethnic. Cardinal Parish being our wealthiest and our largest churches. Or to say it another way, our wealthiest and our largest churches are predominantly and culturally white. And according to a 2018 estimate, 89% of our clergy in this diocese are white. This puts us extremely out of step with the demographics of the Bay Area as a whole and also quite far away from where I think we as a church have said and aspired to be. And so yes, the flesh pots were full in the land of Egypt, but we mustn't forget to tell the whole story. And I can't speak for every church, but I do truly believe that churches become healthier through this kind of examination, this kind of honest look at who we are and who we want to be. And I think we're becoming healthier by being forced to examine this, to, being, to opening ourselves to voices that we have historically marginalized or ignored. There are hard truths in the wilderness but as Exodus reminds us, there is also sufficient grace and strength provided for that journey. And as we are reminded in Exodus, that privilege like manna rots when we hoard it. So it is tempting to look back and wistfully remember the past. And to be clear, not all of it was bad, of course, just as for the Israelites, not all the parts of their life in Egypt were bad, but they were lived under oppressive systems. And there were many things that were difficult. And we are not a people seeking to return to that land. We are a people like them being led into a new land that is more harsh, but also more true. That is more challenging, but also more free. More uncertain and requiring even more trust in God but more real than any day in the land of Egypt ever was. And like the Israelites, the two questions we hold, what is enough? And do we trust God to provide? This is, these are questions that I sit with often when it can feel like the difference between a church surviving and thriving and failing is the work and the actions of its people. And of course that's important. Of course that makes a difference. And of course we work hard. But the challenge in today's text is that God's economy, God's grace, is different from the ways of the world. And our answers to those questions of what is enough and do we trust God, are often what sets us apart from that other kind of economy. After all, we hear in our parable today, Jesus speaking of the workers in the vineyard, that all the workers were paid the same amount regardless of whether they came in the morning or in the midday or later in the day. And we are promised in this parable that there's enough for us and for the new workers too, but 
Sometimes that can feel unfair, which is part of what the parable highlights, as, it, as does the parable of the prodigal son. But the point of these stories, the point of us sharing them is to remind ourselves that there is enough grace. There is enough grace for me, for you, for those folks over there, and for those folks who just showed up too. We must tell our full story, the joy and the pain, the sin and the redemption, the ways in which we have fallen short, and the ways in which we have been forgiven into new life. Because we, like the Israelites, are a people on the move. The doors of the church might be locked for now, but that has not stopped us. We are a people on the move. Not back towards the land of Egypt, but onward to a new land. On to a new land that we have hoped for and not yet seen, that we have been promised but cannot yet imagine. And the wilderness reminds us that there is enough. There is enough even when it may not feel like it, that God is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. join me in prayer. In honor of St. Matthew's Day, which is on Monday, we thank you, Heavenly God, for the witness of your Apostle and Evangelist Matthew to the Gospel of your Son, our Savior. And we pray that after his example, we may with ready wills and hearts obey the calling of our Lord to follow him. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, 
receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you. Through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And lastly, Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>